everyone, um, and welcome to the online Tech Talk series sponsored by the Office of Information Technology, Learning Technologies, and Environments Group. Today we'll be discussing the use of e-text and open content at the University of Maryland. We are joined by Dr. Charles Stanger, psychology professor from the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, Michael Gore, the University Bookstore General Manager, and Chris Colbert, the Barnes & Noble College Booksell Booksellers Regional Manager. They will be sharing with us their experiences and insights on the uses of e-text and open content. Thank you all for joining us here today. Now, if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to type them throughout the session in the chat pod in the lower left-hand side. Now, let's start by, um, we're going to start with uh, Dr. St Hello, Dr. Stanger. Hi, how are you? Doing great. Um, tell us a little bit more about um, yourself and your uses of um, e-textbooks in your classes. Um, well, uh, I have a kind of a, a, a few things. One is that I have now uh, three textbooks that I've published, a couple more actually, but three that are used pretty regularly. One of them was is a research methods textbook that is now in its fourth edition. And it began with Houghton Mifflin and then it was bought by uh, Cengage. And that's basically a paper book. Um, but I noticed that recently Cengage has also been marketing it pretty heavily as an e-book. And as an author, that's kind of surprising because they never ask you anything about it. And I don't actually know, it's curious to me, what proportion of my class, because I, I teach that course and I use the book, I don't know uh, how the students in my class, what they're actually doing, how many of them, it's a big class of over 100 students, I don't know how many of them are actually buying the hard copy, how many of them are getting it new versus used, and how many are using some kind of e-alternative, either chapter by chapter or buying the e-book. So that's something that's kind of an unknown to me, and it's just happened over the past couple of years. And I'm, I'm going to pull my class over the next week and ask them what uh, what course they what book they ended up using. Uh, the other two texts that I have, one of them is an introduction to psychology textbook, uh, and uh, I've just finished a social psychology textbook. Those are both big markets in psychology. Uh, with flat world knowledge, and I, I feel kind of lucky to have gotten involved with them. Uh, it's a startup. It's a couple guys from Prentice Hall who evidently went to Prentice Hall and said, you know, listen, this model that you guys have is screwed up. Uh, everybody knows it. It's not good for students. It's not good for anybody. And we have an idea of uh, making the content more open, even free. And Prentice Hall basically told them to forget it, so they started their own company called Flat World. And Flat World seems to be doing well. It's very early in their career. They've been around for a couple of years, but the number of books that they're doing is increasing. Uh, they got some good startup money, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm pretty excited to be part of it. It's, it's the opposite of working with a big company like Cengage um, or Prentice Hall because those companies are so – they're just so heavy. They have so many layers of editors and, and and editors above the editors and editors above the editors. So when you as an author are talking to someone, uh, they can't really tell you what's going to happen because they have to get it cleared by all the people above them. And it makes it just really slow and, and really not much fun to work with them. Um, but Flat World has been completely opposite. They're also really, really good with authors. I mean, to just give you an example. So if you have a textbook with Prentice Hall, they will sell most of your books in July and August. That's a big sales season for them going into the fall semester. Uh, but the way that they pay you <clears throat> is uh, they pay you semi-annually. So the sales that are made in uh, July – go in the second half of the year, and you actually get your check the following April. 
And that's just an example of ways that they are it's just not friendly to authors. I'll give you one other example, which is that when you sell it when they sell a textbook for you in the United States, then you get your standard fifteen percent royalties or whatever it is, that's pretty standard. But if they sell the textbook anywhere else in the world, including Canada, you get half of that. And it's very difficult to negotiate with them. Flat World, on the other hand, pays you every quarter and they pay you a flat 20% of everything that they sell. And Flat World has a lot of ways of disseminating the book. They have they have the paper book, paper books that you can buy for $29 or sometimes a little more $34 for people who want, who want, who want that. And they're finding that some proportion of the students, you know, like to have the paper book. Uh you can of course see the textbook for free. Uh, online at, at Flat World. It's a little difficult to page through it and it's hard to take notes. You might want to just print out a chapter. You can do that for like three bucks. You might want to stream it on your, um, you know, on your iPad or, or one of your music devices. You can buy uh, uh, an audio version of the text. You can get it for Kindle. And so their idea is to kind of open things up. And it's been really fun working with them. Uh, you know, they are, are author friendly and they haven't put a whole lot of uh, uh, editorial um, stamp on, on me. They, you know, it's been it's been a great review process. I think they're good texts. One thing that they know from day one is that everybody is going to think, oh, if it's free, it can't be any good. Uh, and they need to really w make sure that that doesn't happen. So they I think they've uh, hired some good authors and the, and the review process is is fair and complete without being burdensome. Um, so uh, the psychology book I think is doing pretty pretty well. I'm pretty happy about it. Uh, oh, the, one of the questions here is how did I learn about it? It was pure luck. I was on a, um, a, a list serve for <clears throat> textbook authors, and somebody mentioned something about Flat World, and I, I wrote to uh, this guy Mike Bosey, who's the vice president, and said, well, I might be interested in doing. You know, I had an idea for some book, and he said, no, what we need from you, if you'd like to do it, is an introductory text. And uh, so he talked me into it. I had no idea that I, I could do that or would do that, but it turned out to be really, really fun. So, I don't know, advice for other faculty who are looking to switch, I think, you know, give it a try. I think there's a lot of different options. You know, I'm interested to hear about this Nook uh, option. I think Flat World is a good good source, um, and there's and I think there's a lot more that are happening as well. There's also a lot of schlock. I mean, there's a lot of e stuff out there that really is not very good, so you have to you have to be a little bit careful. And for those who wish to author an e text, well, um, I encourage you to do it. <laughs> the more the better. So that's basically my story about ebooks in in my class and my experience with Flat World. That's great. And um, so when you were working with the Flat World Knowledge Rep, um, were you, I guess, for, were you planning on making an open source e-text or is that something that um, they came up with? Um, well, that's Flat World's model. Um, they say something like, um, oh, I forget what their little, <laughs> their little lingo is, but they will give it free, uh, free, I think it's free online, and affordable offline or something like that. That's their model. The, the book is, they work under the um, Creative Commons license, which uh, means that, uh, another thing I can say about Flower World, which is really pretty exciting, is the customization is just awesome. I mean, so if you adopt my book, for instance, and you discover that you don't, I mean, another one of the big problems with these traditional publishing houses is that, you know, a psychology textbook will have 16 chapters, but an instructor might only use 13 of them. So the students are paying for all of them. Uh, but in Flat World, you can customize. You can take out chapters. You can add your own chapter. And then you just publish the book yourself. And it looks like my book, but it has a thing across the front of it when you look at it that says modified by instructor. And it's clear inside what I wrote and what the instructor added. Uh, so it's very flexible. But that's that's Flat World's knowledge. They're still working on trying to figure out, you know, the things that they do best and 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 how to how to best market it. Great. And have you um, have you gotten any feedback from your students? Um, I know you said earlier you weren't sure how many were using which of your texts, but if I didn't know if you were sure of any were using the Flat World knowledge version. 
Yeah, for me, I do, for me personally, I don't know because I don't actually use either of those texts right now. Um, I, I've been teaching the methods course lately, and I've been using that text. But I know that there are some initiatives, and I've been trying to get involved in some of them to kind of do some research on uh, the effectiveness of open source learning. So there will be more data about that going forward. I don't know too much yet. I think there's some real advantages. One of the real advantages of, the, of, of something like Flat World is that in a big class, Psych 100, the instructor knows that there are many students in the class who have not bought the book because it's $130. But that should be less of a problem when the books are cheaper or even free. So there could be some real advantages, but I don't know yet. Okay. Yeah, that'll be very interesting. You'll have to uh the data that you collect. Um, have you found any disadvantages to using uh, for the e-text? Uh, again, I don't really know. I mean, I could imagine some. I mean, it's it's not so clear to me that, you know, reading things online is going to be as effective as reading them in paper. I mean, my guess is that that's really not a big deal, um, and so that won't be a disadvantage. So I, I don't know what the disadvantages are. I don't know any yet, but there could be some. Okay. Um, I was on Flat World Knowledge the other day. I saw your book and your other book coming out, and it seemed like some other books out there, um, or the e-text, some of them, they offer add-ons. Maybe there's extra study guides or things like that. Um, have you had any experience creating any of those for your books? Or? Well, my books have standard, uh, you know, ancillary. So there is, a, you know, a PowerPoint package. So if you want to be able to display the images from the text, you can do that easily with the PowerPoint package. There's a test bank, of course. And there's also an instructor's guide. But Flat World is not really big on to... Uh, into a lot of ancillaries. They, they don't really have the, you know, the resources to do it. It's not where they're going to compete. And, but I'll tell you honestly that a lot of the ancillaries that come from the traditional houses are just designed to make students buy, buy the book, basically. They package stuff with the book so that you feel like you're going to lose something if you don't buy you know, the new edition. And that's probably unfair. I think there's probably a lot of texts where the ancillaries, the websites, and so forth are really, really very good. Uh, and Flat World might get into it. But, you know, there's so much open source stuff now that, you know, you may not need, that you may not need to keep developing that in-house. So, I don't know. I forget what the original question was. But, yeah, we have the, the – Flat World has the traditional ancillaries. Okay, thanks so much. Is, does anyone um, listening have any questions for Dr. Stanger? Okay, well, um, it looks like there's no more questions right now, but um, Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with uh, your two books and Flat World Knowledge, and we'll continue. I've seen your name in the, um, the Diamondback and all sorts of um, online publications talking about your uses, so this is great. Okay. Well, thanks. It's great to talk to you. I'll stay on for a minute. I'm, I'm interested in hearing about the Nook, but i got to go in about five minutes. Okay, great. So, Chris uh, Colbert and Michael Gore here from the University Bookstore. Um, hi, guys. Do you want to give us a little bit of uh, the audience a quick background on um, your roles in the, using eText at the University Bookstore? So, this is Mike. Uh, we have just really, uh, the Nook is new. It's uh, in the very proactive stage, I guess you'd say, and Chris will get into that a little bit. Uh, we're finding that it's really uh, the ebook is in its infancy in a sense of the fact that we're sending us and asking for ebooks. Um, the students that have taken it have responded to it well. Um, 
it's free, <laughs> which is easy, uh, and we offer test drives. So let Chris get into the details. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, participating today. Um, I'm a regional manager for Barnes & Noble College Division and, um, and intimately involved with the development of our Nook study um, application. Uh, just to brief you on what that exactly is, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with Nook, the device, much like the Kindle that Dr. Uh, Stanger spoke of earlier. This is different in that Nook study is a software application that, as Mike mentioned, is free for download to any Mac or PC um, platform. Um, it allows, where Dr. Stanger talked about the creation of digital content, um, Nook Study is more for the consumption on the student side. It allows students to really manage their, their course materials, be it a textbook, um, assignments given by the professor, syllabi, handouts, any research, allows them to consolidate all of those materials into one um, software application, allows them to annotate, highlight, uh, create web links, do research within Nook Study. It really is an all-in-one all encompassing um, study tool to help students consume digital content. Um, it, the Mike mentioned digital content is in an infancy. It, you know, it's been around for some eight to 10 years, but we've really seen an explosive growth in the last uh, uh, 18 to 24 months. In the last year, we've seen digital sales grow by 3,000%. Um, by 2014, a lot of industry experts are expecting that about 60% of all textbooks will be available digitally. Um, and that will really drive the consumer usage because not everything is available right now. Uh, Dr. Sanger mentioned a lot of open content. That's certainly out there. But publishers are, are not really going back and, and digitizing their back catalog. They're, they're waiting for new editions to come out and they're digitizing all the new, uh, the new content. So we expect to see that, that rise. Um, but that said, only about three to four percent of our, our total company sales come from the sale of e-textbooks. Uh, in Maryland, that's 3.7 percent. So in the big scheme of things, it's a relatively small percentage, but as I said earlier, growing exponentially. Um, Nook Study is really an end user um, application um, that can be used by students. We are integrating now with uh, learning management systems like Blackboard or, or Sakai, Moodle, and Canvas. Uh, that allows the students and professors to, uh, lots of professors to adopt the uh, materials within the LMS, um, you know, assign uh, assignments, reading assignments within the LMS, allows students to see that activity and, and, and manage their course materials in that way. The other um, <clears throat> thing I wanted to mention about uh, students' uh, migration to digital um, in the in survey results that we've, we've compiled in the last couple of years, really price is the driving factor. Um, digital textbooks are, are traditionally around 60% off of, off of the new book price. Um, so that's certainly a, a factor when, when students are making their buying decision. Uh, curiosity is another thing. Um, but as Dr. Stanger mentioned, it's very difficult for students to consume um, an, an e-book like they would when they, when they buy the hard copy, when they have their laptop open, their notebooks, their notes from the from the lecture. That's where Nook Study, I think, plays a key role, allowing all those materials to be integrated into one application. So, Lauren, is there anything else you wanted to ask? Yes. Oh, yeah. This is this is really fascinating. Um, have this maybe this one maybe is more for Michael, but um, have you seen an increase in the number of faculty that are requesting the e-text this year? And does the university, does the bookstore have a plan for navigating this new um, new way of getting textbooks? Uh, this previous year or this current year, we haven't seen a big increase. We are, our big focus going forward is to make sure that the faculty knows that they're aware of it, make sure that uh, it's linked on the university site so they can at least see what it does, uh, promote our faculty center network, and which shows how it works with any format. Um, you know, we mentioned that um, it's available on Blackboard, it's available on Sakai, and it's also available on Canvas um, and Noodle. So what we want to do is make sure that the faculty becomes more and more aware of it, and then 
What's great about the Nook is you can take it, what we call a test drive. You can download a book for free for, I believe, a week. And you can see all the different applications. You can see, you can highlight in different colors. You can take uh, notes in it. It's very, very user friendly. Um, it has a definite cost saving. The bookstore industry right now is going through a dramatic change. Uh, rental is huge. And um, the sales at full price are, uh, you know, it's sort of like Black Friday. It's going out of business. Uh, and we're trying to be proactive and have everything that the student could use. Uh, I think as faculty, if we can get the faculty to do a test drive on it, uh, we're looking for feedback. Uh, and I think they'll, they'll see that it is a valuable entity. Lauren, just to build on what Mike just said, what we do do is, uh, even if faculty is not aware of the digital option, um, when they place their adoption with the book center, we will uh, make a match. We'll, we'll go. We'll, we'll cross-reference their adoption with the digital database, which now for Nook Studies over two million titles, a lot of which are open content and general trade book knowledge, uh, trade book titles. Excuse me. Um, fewer textbooks, but as, as as I mentioned earlier, we expect the the number of titles in the higher education arena to increase over the next couple of years. Um, but we'll we'll list that book as a digital option for the student with the price savings that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then Mike will do uh, his part to educate the faculty that is an option for for their students, and hopefully they'll promote that uh, in in their classrooms. That was actually just my next question. So, if a faculty member um, maybe they don't know which book they're going to use, is there a way for them to um, see a listing of the books available through the Nook Study if they would like to choose one that way? Uh, the, Mike mentioned the Faculty Center Network. That is a database of all of all uh, of all textbook titles um, that are used across the country. It's a peer-to-peer -peer driven um, network where um, you can, if you're teaching a book in whatever discipline, you can go onto the Faculty Center Network and see what what books are commonly used, uh, read user reviews from other faculty members, um, understand what's available digitally. So that that is one option. Um, if a faculty member has any questions on whether a book is uh, available digitally, they can certainly contact. Uh, the book center, and even if it's not uh, available digitally currently, uh, we can work. Um, our Nook Study development team works closely with all the publishers, um, and we can work to try to get that book uh, digitized for classroom use. Um, publishers are very excited about Nook Study because we protect uh, what's called their digital rights management, or DRM for short. Um, we all know about the music industry and the, the difficulties they face. Um, publishers are very mindful of that, and they do not want their content to be um, shared and, dis and distributed much like the music industry. So um, Nook Study um, protects their DRM in by, you know, publishers set the terms for uh, copying or lending or how much can be printed out at a given time. So whatever the publisher um, dictates, uh, Nook Study will respect and, and place those restrictions on them. Um, it's interesting, nobody likes... Um, to be told how to use a, a consumer product they just bought, um, and certainly we've you know tried to funnel that feedback back to publishers. Um, but it's interesting that when students use um, digital content, they tend not to violate or, or exceed uh, most of the limits that are set by publishers. But it's just a notion that hey, I can't do something that they don't like. To, <laughs> they don't like to be told that. Um, but um, that, that's really. Um, Actually, one element that that, that, that publishers are uh, respect and, and like about uh, Nook Study. Yeah, I was definitely curious if uh, there was pushback coming from publishers, since it is, like you mentioned, usually about 60% of a uh, cost savings. Um, but it seems well, like they are excited about. It. Well, there are, and, they, and, they, and it's a new distribution channel for them. A lot of publishers, uh, Dr. Stanger mentioned Cengage earlier, they are very active in the, in the digital arena. Um, there are a couple of, of the large publishers uh, that are. Um, we as a company bought over 210 unique, 210,000, excuse me, unique titles from over 7,500 publishers last year across all of our, of all of our uh, college stores. Um, but really the, the large five publishers are really driving this initiative. 
Um, and they're looking to, for new ways to distribute, to distribute their content, quite frankly. Um, we are looking to be a vehicle for which they can distribute their content in Nook Study. For, for a student, you know, we mentioned LMS systems earlier. Um, Cengage has a building block, as does McGraw-Hill and all the other major publishers. Um, but Nook Study really integrates all their content into one place. And that's where we see the advantage for Nook Study as opposed to, you know, individual building blocks for individual publishers. Okay, great. And so, Chris, you're the regional manager. Um, do you have other universities that you support that are using this as well, and how is it going for them? Uh, yeah, my, my region uh, extends uh, from New York City, I see Columbia University, um, down through the College of William & Mary, so I'm kind of the mid-Atlantic area. I have about the 12 large universities uh, that, that uh, I work with. Um, and the University of Maryland is not unique in that um, the percentage is, is roughly about the same everywhere. About three to four percent of sales activity are coming from from digital. Um, we are working closely with all of our university partners to, you know, educate about uh, Nook Study and, and the migration to digital, and trying to work with um, the learning management systems to integrate our Nook Study um, building block onto their systems. Um, so it, it is a relatively new arena, but uh, one that we are all in on and look forward to uh, to working with the, the college on that. Well, thank you both. Um, now let's uh, open it up. Is anyone in the audience have any questions for Michael or Chris? Okay, guys, it looks like um, not many more. Uh, let's see, no. Um, do, you have, do you guys have anything, last things to add? or? No, I think I'm, I'm set, Lauren. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you both for uh, coming here and sharing your experiences. Thanks to everyone for coming out um, on your Monday. I know it's Monday back after Thanksgiving is a little bit tough, but thank you, everyone. And great job. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.